Mysteries of God do not lie. The foreknowledge of God is real. Quoting Peter, quoting Proverbs. The apostles after Acts. And is believing in the creation story in the Bible illogical? All of that and more coming up next. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. And we're almost done with that year. In fact, today on the Bible, we're going to be talking from 1 Peter 1 to 5, where we learn mysteries do not lie. Foreknowledge of God is real, and we'll talk about what that means all coming up in just a moment. Right now, Corey is here with Bible History and Archaeology. Corey. Today we are going to be taking a look at the lives of some of the apostles after the history of the book of Acts. All right, after the history of the book of Acts. Very good. Now we'll to go to Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. What are you doing, Ryan? Today, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati joins us one last time as I ask him a bit more about the Evolution's Achilles Heels Project and if he believes that believing in the creation story in Genesis is illogical. Is it illogical? Well, that's a good question. A lot of people say it is, but we'll talk about that coming up later. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we have for the Bible discovery question? Well, we're going to finish this verse. It was quoted by Peter. Do you know, Peter quotes Proverbs 3, 34, when he says, God resists the proud, but gives what? As we read through the books of the New Testament that were written by some of the apostles, the disciples of Jesus Christ, those original 12, it's very fitting that we take a look into the lives of the apostles after the New Testament history was finished being written. After his miraculous release from prison recorded in Acts chapter 12, specific details of Apostle Peter's life are largely left out of the biblical narrative. Save having two epistles written by him to believers, we are left only with history and traditions that were passed along by the church and written down by church historians. A great compiler of these documents is the church leader and historian Eusebius, writing from Caesarea Maritima in the early 4th century AD. Eusebius lived through the brutal Christian persecutions of Emperor Diocletian and survived to see Emperor Constantine declare Christian tolerance. Eusebius was no stranger to pain and controversy, and it is from this context that he gathers the records of the lives and deaths of the apostles. According to his history, the Apostle Peter and his wife traveled much before arriving in what would be their final earthly destination, Rome. According to Eusebius, testified by other historians, Simon the Sorcerer, who stars in Acts chapter 8 in a conflict with Peter, had made a new living as a false teacher in Rome. Peter is credited with squelching these flames of evil before taking his place as the leader of the Church of Rome. This leadership must have been short-lived. In AD 64, Emperor Nero began an extermination of the Christians of Rome. In a brutal display of uncontrolled malice, Nero's personal gardens were used as display grounds for the bodies of executed Christians. Paul, as a citizen of Rome, was mercifully beheaded, but Peter, with many unknown believers, was crucified. 
Tradition holds that Peter's wife was executed before him, bound and thrown to wild animals. Peter's last words to his wife, being led to slaughter, are famed to have been a calling out of her name, followed by, remember the Lord. There are things that angels are curious to look into. Now, the book of 1 Peter presents an interesting view of this to us and to the people of Peter's time. The Bible explains that the presentation in this book is to the people who are pilgrims of the dispersion. 1 Peter is a fascinating read for those who are interested in slowing down to study it well. The words of the apostle tell us of the deep understanding that he had about Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Thank you for staying with Bible Discovery TV and Quick Study Television. And we have a great study for you today on 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, 1 Peter is an interesting book written to those who are in dysphoria. And this is fascinating. So as we look at this particular passage, we're going to study it carefully. We're going to study it slowly. We're going to the point, and then we're going to present the ideas behind it. Very interesting. There are three points that we're going to start today and four points in your Bible guide that you can actually look at yourself. I want to look at the overview as we take this in motion. It says, Strong God, and I love this. It is a reading assignment of 1 Peter chapter 1 to 5. If you read 1 Peter today, you will keep up with us as we go through the Bible chronologically. Our focus is on 1 Peter 1, 1 to 12. And in this passage, 
we're going to study the first part of his book that helps explain what he's trying to say. Now let's go into the scripture where it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge, the foreknowledge, that's knowledge before, of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and for sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Now, I love this passage because it, it speaks a, a great deal in the introduction about the complexities that God is presenting, but with the beauty of his foreknowledge. Now, foreknowledge is an interesting idea that we don't often think of in today's world. But foreknowledge is that thing to know knowledge before it actually happens. And so the mysteries do not lie, but they're profound. The foreknowledge of God is required to gather the meaning here. Now, this is important for you to understand. You know, people say, well, I'm trying to understand God. I'm trying to realize it. Well, you can only understand a portion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but when you begin to recognize that God knew you before you were born, God chose you before you were born, you begin to understand the providence of the Lord Almighty and how important that is. And it is important. So that's in something you keep in mind about mysteries. Now let's go on to chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He rose from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven. It's in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through your faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now look at that, in the last time. That's important. Let's take a look at the, the point and then we'll talk about it. Mysteries do not require an explanation. God has preserved for us a heavenly place. Notice here that the Bible is very specific. That God explains that what is done on earth as we address God the Father is done in heaven, beloved. So heaven has the place, it has the space that's done in heaven. If we pray, then it, our prayers reach heaven. That's important. So in other words, as we choose correctly, it happens in heaven. Now this was referred to in the Lord's Prayer where it says, Thy will be done our prayer, or our prayer in heaven should be the same as our prayer on earth. Now that's important for you to understand, beloved. So keep that in mind when you focus on your lifestyle with Jesus Christ. So that goes on then to the next point. This is chapter 1, verse 6 of 1 Peter. It, in this you greatly rejoice, that though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and to honor and the glory of the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. You believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory." receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is exciting, beloved. The amazing thing about Jesus Christ and his faith is it's more precious than gold. The point is, mysteries never need an explanation. Jesus Christ is real. His life, his death, his resurrection is real. Now, a lot of people say, well, how can you serve a God, Jesus Christ, that you can't see? He happened 2,000 years ago and you don't really know it. Here is the fact. The fact is that Jesus Christ was risen on the third day, seen by over 500 people. 
So you have to understand and you have to realize that Jesus Christ had started something that did not and will not end. He is going to take it right through the tribulation, uh, right through the time when he comes again. And when he comes again, there you'll be. And so his glory starts here, but then works its way up to the end of time. Now, there's a small dip in the seven-year tribulation, but at the end of time, he reveals himself. Now, how important is that to you today with where you are, with what you have? It is very important. So the fact is that the Christian faith, your faith and my faith, is better than gold here on earth. It's better than you winning the lottery. It's better than anything. And so I want to encourage you today to come to Jesus Christ and know the Lord your Savior, for He understands exactly what it is that you're going through and how to make you right with Him. Come to Jesus today. Advance yourself into His salvation. program, you and I took a look at the life of the uh, disciple turned apostle Peter and what happened after the book of Acts was completed. Now you and I are going to focus in on James, who the early church titled James the Just. James, the brother of Jesus Christ, is an intriguing person both in and out of the New Testament. That he is the brother of Jesus through Mary and Joseph is put forward in the Gospels, as well as his original disbelief in Jesus as the Son of God. At some point, however, this belief changed. James, brother of Jesus, became James the Just, James the Bulwark of the People, James the Righteous, first Christian Bishop of Jerusalem. In the book of Acts, Jesus' mother and brothers, including James, are in Jerusalem with the disciples. 1 Corinthians 15 records Jesus specifically appearing to James within that time. Through the rest of the book of Acts, any major occurrence in Jerusalem includes James. He is a key person in the education of the Apostle Paul. He acts as an authority among the disciples as well as authoring a letter of the New Testament. From sources outside of the Bible, the rest of the life of James the Just can be pieced together. According to all accounts, James was highly respected. He was elected Bishop of Jerusalem without argument. He was raised as a Nazarite, a man with vows to God, a man so dedicated to praying for the people that his knees became calloused sparking another affectionate nickname, Camel Knees. James' earthly life came to an end violently. One Passover, conspirators had their perfect chance. They asked James to teach the crowd from a high spot on the temple. During his sermon, they pushed the elderly man off. The fall did not kill him, so his accusers began to stone him for blasphemy. But James continued to pray for them. Finally, a launderer hit James on the head with a club to finish off the dying man. This is the testimony of James, brother of Jesus. War. When is it right? When is it wrong? There are principles guiding us in this fallen world to make good decisions about when to fight and how to fight. Join Corey, Janice, and Rod Hembry as they uncover the facts of war and learn what the Bible says about holy war. This video is critical for every believer to know now. When is it right to go to war? For your copy, write to us and send $25 as an offering or more to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada and the rest of the world, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also get this particular video at www.biblediscoverytv.com. For safe giving, give there.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study. It is good for you to be here as we go through the Bible in one year. I need to tell you that next time on the Quick Study broadcast, we're going to be talking from Hebrews 7 to 10. Great mysteries are contained in the Word of God. We can and we will explore them. That's coming up next time on Quick Study. Right now, it's time for Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? In today's interview, I asked Dr. Sarfati a bit more about the Evolution's Achilles Heels project. For example, what is the value of this project? Is this something the average Christian should have? And do you need to have a PhD to understand it? Also, I asked him if the creation worldview is illogical. Here's Dr. Sarfati. Well, the Achilles Heel Project, the book is already pr printed and available. The, the DVD, I've seen the uh, footage of a DVD in full, it just hasn't been put, printed to DVDs yet. Now, the point about that is you've got these uh, people who are, who are PhD scientists in lots of different fields, all saying that evolution is, is fallacious on many different levels. My own chapter involves the origin of first life, chemical evolution, but you've got people talking about natural selection, how it's inadequate. You've got genetics, uh, radioactive dating, cosmogony the beginning of the, of the universe, yeah, and uh, geology and the flood and the fossil records. You've got these experts in their own field talking about why their own field contradicts evolution. And the final chapter is about the ethical implications. Why does this matter for Christians today? Uh, which is about ethics and morality. And the film uh, develops that, as, that issue uh, quite a bit too. <music> Well, absolutely, because uh, you cannot escape evolution. Even if you come through a homeschooling family, you are getting evolution through the media, uh, the news, but you cannot escape it. In fact, you shouldn't try to escape, you should try to counteract it. And that's what I advise parents to do, is to make sure their kids know about evolution and know what's wrong with it. And this book uh, has a whole lot of things that are wrong, cutting edge research in, in specialist fields, what's wrong with evolution, and then the last chapter, how it, it matters for ethics and morality, and what the better alternative to this. That is the, uh, the aim is that we, we wouldn't have to be because uh, it's written so, so other people can understand it. But we had to have the PhD authors, so people in, in their own field writing, but hopefully uh, able to explain to people who are non-PhDs. And let's face it, all of us, I mean, every one of the other chapters is outside my field, okay? So I have to be able to understand I'm a PhD in chemistry. It doesn't make me an expert in the fossil record or paleontology and things. So if I can understand the rest of the chapter, I don't see why you guys can't either. Actually, the creation worldview is the only view that actually gives us a, a correct account for logic in the first place. Because God himself is logical and made us in his image. Jesus is called the Logos, the word we get the, where we get the word logic from. So the creation, Christian worldview has historically been uh, the um, foundation for logical thinking. In the Middle Ages, the so-called Dark Age, very misnamed thing called the Dark Ages, uh, Christian philosophers developed logic to a very high level and surpassed the ancient Greeks because they solved some of the logical paradoxes that the ancient Greeks could not solve. Aristotle thought they were insoluble, like a paradox is, um, what I am now saying is false. Is that false or true? Okay. Uh, but the Middle Ages philosophers developed that into they could solve these paradoxes. You see, uh, evolution cannot give this foundation for logic because evolution selects for survival advantage and not for logicality. So you could have an illogical belief, but it helps you uh, leave more offspring. That is what evolution is going to select. It doesn't actually uh, select for logic or truth. I'd like to say a big thank you to Dr. Jonathan Sarfati for allowing me to interview him. Dr. Sarfati has authored several books as well as articles, which I highly recommend. And you can find those, of course, at CMI's website at creation.com. Creation.com is the website. It's a great place, Ryan. Thank you so much for your work. And Dr. Sarfati is really quite the guy. He's, He's something man. else. Mm -hmm. He really is. Uh, could he answer this Bible IQ question? You know, I think that he could. Did you notice I said Bible IQ? I did. Yeah, he probably could. Okay, so what is it? Well, you know, much of the New Testament is quoting from the Old Testament, and that's what we're looking at today. Uh, Peter quotes Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, when he says this, and we're going to finish it today. God resists the proud, but gives what? 
Gives what? What does he do? He resists the proud and he gives what? Corey, what does he give? Okay, I think that the answer is grace to the humble. Grace okay. to the humble. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. She's absolutely right. And I hope that you were too. You will find that in 1 Peter 5.5. 5. And he quotes that from Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 34. All right, very good. I want to offer this one last time. We have really 30 quickly. seconds, one okay. last time. These are all the guides from the 2000, uh, this year, 2014. We're doing new guides in 2015, great guides. And if you want to get your copies of these, and this is the last one, this is going to be a $100 gift to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150, or P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. It is absolutely amazing that the Christian faith exists and stands strong in today's heavy culture of doubt and despair. For a long time, people in science and education have worked very hard to disprove God and His creation. They have failed. They have not made the progress they desire to make because the human mind is spiritual. The way in which people on this planet respond to the culture of doubt is by making that doubt a religion. It is most important that we ready ourselves for the great discovery in the near future. There will be a great revival and awakening of people to God and His Son, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. With that, we pray today very simply, Lord, I need you. In our Strength in Your Mind segment today, we've got a great passage in the New King James Version for you. Now see if you can find this. Where does the Bible say, therefore, since all of these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct or godliness? Now, that's an interesting question. Now, if you think you know the answer to that, remember it's the New Testament. Uh, I, I gave you a hint there. And also remember that it's the New King James Version. Okay, so I'm not going to say any more because I'll mess it up. If you think you know, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the bottom where it says Strengthen Your Mind. But I want to tell you something. Who brought you this program today? We didn't bring it to you. We've worked on it and we work with it. But God Almighty brought you this program through Jesus Christ, His only Son. And he desires you to come to him and pray and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I come to you. I believe you rose from the dead and I take you as my Lord.